So I'm going to do a bit of a, a mixed presentation. The, the first bit, um, sort of foundational stuff with Jeb, explain what it is, how you use it. At the end, I'm going to dig into using Jeb uh, with Source Labs, which is an open, sorry, it's a cloud browser provider essentially. So you can run your tests on the cloud, do multi-browser stuff. We have a look at uh, dealing with parallelism and the reporting aspects of that. So um, if, if you've used it before, some of this stuff might be um, stuff that you already know. Hopefully there's some new things in there that you may have missed in the documentation. So, uh, yeah, sorry, my name is Luke Davis on the slide. Uh, I'm the project lead of Jeb. So Jeb is open source, um, Apache license version 2. Current version is 0 0.9.0. Uh, we're hoping to get to 1.0 out sometime this year. We are six years in the making. Uh, there's a few links up there for different uh, resources for Jeb. These slides will be published after the fact. Uh, the most important one, though, is that we the book of Jeb, the manual. So a lot of the things I'll be going through today, you can find much more information, much more in-depth information here. So this is really kind of the, the Bible of Jeb. Uh, we put a lot of work into uh, really trying to document well the features of Jeb. So um, check that out. The home page is jebish.org. So that's where you can go and get all the information. As a link to the manual and all that stuff. Source codes up on GitHub, all that great stuff. OK, so what does it do? Uh, Jeb is fundamentally a browser automation solution. Um, at its heart, that's what it does. And we integrate with different testing frameworks because that's what you usually want to automate a browser for, simulating what the user does. Uh, so you can test your web applications and verify that they work. So it's good for testing web applications, automating websites, screen scraping. I've seen usage of Jeb where a, um, a company, their business model was to effectively undercut their competitors on a daily basis. So they had Jeb scripts that ran in the morning, crawled their competitors' sites, found out what the prices were, fed that into their database. So which is kind of a novel use of it. I don't know if it's ethically the right thing to do, but they could use Jeb for that. So there's four main parts of Jeb, or four sort of key ideas that came together to make Jeb what it was. It builds on top of WebDriver, the Selenium uh, 2, Project that actually does the heavy lifting. Yeah, not doing well, standing still. Uh, jQuery is inspired by jQuery for its, its model for selecting content and dealing with page contents. Obviously, heavy use of Groovy, and we'll dig into some of the uh, Groovy aspects that it uses. And page object modeling. So, a little bit about WebDriver. Uh, has anybody used Selenium 1? The old kind of point and click. Uh, ID based thing, yeah. So Selenium 2 is its successor to that. It's a more programmatic style. It's uh, being led out of Google. Um, well, actually, more so out of Facebook these days. The project lead has moved from Google to Facebook. Uh, one of the most interesting things about it is it's becoming a W3C standard. What does that mean for an automation tool? Well, effectively, there'll be a certification that browsers can get to be WebDriver compliant. So there will be a standard API that a browser can expose, and WebDriver can use that to automate it. What that fundamentally means is uh, people like us trying to automate browsers is that it's putting the responsibility for making this kind of thing possible back on the browser vendor, which fundamentally means better integration, uh, less flaky tests, uh, more performance, that kind of thing. So it's a really exciting initiative. Uh, still in the early stages, though. So this is what some raw WebDriver code looks like. The fundamental premise and the revolutionary idea was this idea that they could have one standard interface for talking to a browser and automating it, and then different implementations of that interface for different browsers. Pretty, uh, in hindsight, pretty common sense idea, but it took us a while to, to get there as an industry to have a tool like this. Uh, it's it's uh, many language bindings available for WebDriver. Java is primarily implemented in Java, and it's kind of the most people are using it on that language. It's uh, kind of wordy. It has a kind of a verbose API. It's, it's a lower level tool. We'll see how Jeb can release some of that pain. Works with Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, uh, all the browsers that you would expect. Also supports mobile browsers. You can use WebDriver and Jeb to automate browse, uh, browsers on the iPad, iPhone, Android, all that stuff as well, which is becoming more and more important. 
And interestingly, you can also use the device emulators. So if you're wanting to test an iPhone, you can plug in Xcode and use the iPhone simulator and drive the browser there. So you don't need to actually have all these devices. I just want to quickly mention um, a headless browser implementation. So who's heard of Phantom JS? So Phantom is essentially the WebKit rendering engine without a GUI layer. It gives you programmatic access to the rendering engine. And so that's really useful for running automated tests because we don't really care about the rendering. So we just want to go through the process and go through the pages and we can interact with them and click on them and do these kinds of things. But, um, and that gives us some speed advantages. The browser doesn't have to paint the HTML to the screen, do the actual whole rendering process. So it gives us a higher throughput in running our tests. So, and it's also, we don't need a display environment, therefore it's CI friendly, those kind of things. So um, if you're looking to run Jeb tests or Selenium tests in CI, it's an interesting option. Let's look at that. One of the really interesting features of Selenium is not just about the API for driving browsers, the infrastructure for managing a farm of browsers and connecting to them and doing that kind of thing. Because if you think about it, if you're doing this stuff seriously and you want to be testing your application in Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, etc., that's quite a lot of stuff. And you need a way to effectively manage your fleet of browsers. And at the end, we'll look at using Source Labs, a cloud provider that really takes care of a lot of that, uh, the raw infrastructure there of having machines with browsers, etc. And you can just use the Selenium um, capability here to drive those browsers. So some good and bad points about WebDriver. It's really the only viable option for doing this kind of thing. There are so historically been some competing libraries but WebDriver has really jumped quite out uh, ahead of other um, technologies, and I wouldn't, at this point, back anything else. I think it's quite stable. It's been around for a long time. It's still actively developed, and companies like Google and Facebook are putting resources into it. So it's clearly the market leader in terms of browser automation. Talking about WebDriver in isolation, though, it's a rather verbose, low-level tool. It's fundamentally talking about automating a browser, it doesn't really deal with um, the aspects that are unique to application testing, such as how do you structure tests, how do you model your domain, etc. It's really focused at that lower level. So Jeb tries to Jeb leverages all the great things about WebDriver, uses it to do the heavy lifting and talking to the browser, but fits a kind of framework on top to give some structure to the way you automate things. So jQuery, um, sure, who's here is using jQuery? So, Jeb doesn't use jQuery, it kind of took inspiration from it. So this is some jQuery code here to grab some content on a page. It's a much more uh, explicit and easy to understand model than using complicated XPath, and it's fundamentally more powerful. So given this jQuery code that I would use to find content on the page, this is actual Jeb code. Very similar, how you use it. A magical dollar function gives you a data type that's very similar to the jQuery object. One thing to note though is that the APIs aren't identical. If you're wondering about the Jeb API, going to the jQuery documentation is not the place to go. So it takes inspiration, it's not a copy. So what are the, what, when we talk about inspiration, what are the features we're talking about? CSS-based content lookups. CSS selector is an incredibly powerful mechanism for specifying content on a page much more precise, much more um, readable, comprehensible than the XPath. So lookups are, are based on CSS selectors. There's this model object, uh, similar to the jQuery object, that represents the content that you pulled out of the page, following that same pattern. Relative lookups. If you've ever dealt with markup that you don't have control over, you'll know that it's sometimes, and you've done this kind of thing before, it can be sometimes hard to directly address content on the page via XPath or CSS. What you often want to do is to something with a specific ID and then say move next to it or get something around that. So this idea of relative content lookup and a chaining fluent API. Uh, Groovy, we all know about Groovy here at this conference, which is great. So, yeah. Uh, 
uh, it's fundamentally its own thing. So WebDriver gives us the ability to do the CSS lookups. So WebDriver, you can throw a CSS selector at it and get back a bunch of data types in its API. Using Jeb, you're abstracted away from that and you have this jQuery object that sits on top. So um, you don't, it works exactly the same as the browser does. So if you're, you say, using Chrome and you put a CSS selector in the DevTools or something like that, you'll get exactly the same results using a CSS selector in Jeb and uh, WebDriver because it actually is sending the CSS selector to the browser and asking the browser, what did that match? Does that answer the question? So Jeb, what does Jeb, our group readers, Jeb use? Makes extensive use of method missing and property missing. The DSL is very dynamic, which gives us a certain kind of conciseness. Lots of closures and, and using closure delegates to implement little tiny DSLs. We do use some compile time transforming to give implicit assertions. We don't do too much of that, but um, all these things come together to really give us, for Jeb, one of the goals was providing a concise and comprehensible DSL. If you've ever looked at uh, web driver tests or um, all the tools, it can be sometimes hard to look at a test and understand what it's doing. And you spend a lot of your time trying to work out exactly what this is testing and where it's going in the application. One of the goals of Jeb is to be able to provide that information very quickly. So what does it look like? So I have a very simple rat pack application here that we're going to do some automation on. So I'm going to go through a few different iterations of Jeb code, removing explicitness and just kind of hopefully highlight the way the DSL works. So this is kind of the most verbose Jeb code you could possibly write. Implement it as a single script. We're not really doing testing here. We're just running Jeb via a Ruby script. So the first thing we do is we create a new Jeb.browser object. We're going to go to the login page. And our application is a simple. Username and password form that I can sign in with. So via this browser object, I can get a reference page object, which is representing the content there. And that has a certain API that I can do things with. I'm verifying the title of the page. I'm doing some content lookups. Here, I'm finding some form elements and setting some values, this kind of thing. So simple to use, but there's a lot of noise here. So let's just run this. Nope, might miss it. So I've just got a little script in here to pause the execution so I can control when it starts. There it goes, it filled in the form, went to the login fail page, ran through here. So I could change this, let's make it fail. So we've got a failure, we're expecting login results, and we got, so we were expecting this, and we got login results. The string, effectively, yeah, it's, it's simulating somebody typing on a keyboard, so which is what's going to happen, it's firing the same JavaScript events and things, so, yeah. It actually is, in this case, simulating somebody really pressing the keyboard. As far as what Chrome can see, that's what's happening. So that's a difference between, it's recently become somewhat popular to use JavaScript to do this kind of testing, front-end testing, simulating all these kinds of events. So it's firing synthetic events saying that this was clicked and this was typed. But uh, you run into some issues there because they aren't real events. They're synthesized, therefore they don't have the same characteristics. So with WebDriver, it actually is instructing the browser through the front end via the OS essentially, saying this is what's happening. So it's much more realistic. Yep. Absolutely, yep, it's all available too. So the next step I'm going to do to remove some of the noise is to use the browser drive method. So I'm not initiating a browser now, I'm using this drive method, which is behind the scenes, creating a browser instance, 
and now within this closure, the browser is the delegate. So it's the target. I don't have to do browser dot anymore. Got my page in here, doing the same thing. But I can actually also drop the page as well. I don't have to explicitly reference it. But the browser object will dynamically delegate method calls and property accesses to the page object, which means it's another level I can drop. So it's starting to get better here. Cut some noise out. And so we've got, when we go from using the page style, we can start using this dollar function, which in the DSL is how we select content out. So I'm grabbing the H1, I'm saying I want to, I'm expecting this text to be please sign in. Cutting some noise out. And the final thing we can do to clean this up is we can use, we can assign values to form elements and read them just as our Groovy properties. So it's going to use the name of the form elements. In this case, it's going to get the first uh, input element or text area, anything that's a kind of form control, who has, that has a name, username. That's how this is going to work. So I don't have to individually address different form contents. I can just write to it like Groovy properties. We're going to go into this uh, in a little bit. In this case, we're going into explicit page modeling. So instead of talking about in our automation scripts or our tests having these kind of hard coded uh, definition content we're grabbing out, we can actually, using the page objects, model the content on the page. Instead of talking about H1s and other things, we can actually give names to this content. So we talk about the heading, this kind of thing. So we're getting closer to natural language, and we'll dig into that. So that was just running a script that's uh, useful for demoing Jeb, but 99% of the time what you want to do is actually run tests. So Jeb can be used with a bunch of different testing libraries. It can be used with Spock, uh, which is what we're going to be using in a second. If you're doing this kind of thing, um, the, the testing framework of choice, for me at least. JUnit, TestNG if you want to use that, uh, EasyB and Cucumber. It also gets um, sometimes used with Fitness. As well, if you want to do um, kind of wiki BDD style stuff, it all works there. You can just kind of Google for Jeb and Fitness and you'll find some plugins on that. But Spock is the kind of default stance. Um, I, I created Jeb after using Spock for a while. Who here doesn't know about Spock? Okay, Google it. It's a, uh, it's a groovy testing framework that can replace JUnit essentially. It's a much better testing experience. More or less a drop in replacement for JUnit. No, we can use it with Java, yeah. Absolutely. You still, you write your test in Groovy, but you can test Java code. Yeah. We'll see some Spock in a second. So when you're using Jeb with, uh, for running tests, you also need to pull in a specific testing adapter. At the core of Jeb, it's just the browser automation stuff, and here's where we integrate with uh, the testing framework. And there's also a ready to go Grails plugin too if you're um, testing Grails apps. So when we put this stuff together, this is kind of what it, uh, we have, when we're running Jeb tests, some kind of execution tool, something that is orchestrating the test execution process, some kind of test framework within there, so um, is it your J units or your Sparks or something like that. We integrate with a specific testing adapter at the Jeb level, so the Jeb testing adapter is about uh, hooking in the DSL into however that particular test framework happens to work. Then this is where you write your code, the, the Jeb layer here, using the Jeb DSL. And underneath Jeb, what Jeb's job is, is to talk to WebDriver and translate the Jeb DSL into the WebDriver API. WebDriver talks to the browser, and then the browser talks to your application that you're testing. Inside a test, much like what we just saw with the browser drive method, where it was implicitly delegating to the browser object, in our test, we use that same DSL. So I can use the same kind of code I use in my drive block, and it will just dynamically do that via method missing and property missing. That's runtime delegation. Another feature that the test adapters give you is the ability to take screenshots and HTML reports as the tests are executing. So after each test method, Jeb will just automatically 
grab the HTML based on the current page state, save it as a file, and take a screenshot for you as well, which is really useful with debugging. And for all of the testing adapters, you can choose to use this feature or not. So in, if we're using, say, JUnits, you would typically extend, if you don't want the reporting features, the JEB test class, but there's a JEB reporting test that adds in the reporting features. And similarly for Spock, et cetera. So let's go to the test. So this is what our, how we left effectively the non-page object version of our test scripts. If we go to, here is the same thing wrapped up in a JUnit test. So we essentially just copy pasted that code from the drive block inside a JUnit test method. That's all we had to do. Jeb takes care of provisioning the browser and doing all that stuff for us. But if we're using Spock, we can get a little more groovy and DSL-like. So for those who haven't seen Spock, one of the one of the many things that Spock does is gives you a certain structure to your tests. You break it down into different steps of stimulus and response. So when I do this to my application, then I expect this to happen. So when I go to the login page, and this pause stuff is just for the test to get that little pause jet thing up. What have I done here? So when I go there, then I expect the page title to be sign in page. I expect the header one text to be this, exactly the same logic. I can run this right in my IDE. Behind the scenes, Jeb is using a configuration framework to work out where is the application that I'm testing. I've only said go to slash login. I haven't given it a full address and which browser to use. And that's managed via, I don't have one. There are a few ways to set this up. I think I'm, oh, here it is. So it's found on the class path, it's Jeb config file. This is a Groovy script with a kind of configuration DSL, which is how I configure the way Jeb should work. So I'm trying to automate Chrome here, so I create an instance of the web driver Chrome driver. This is the base URL of my application. All of my URLs are going to be resolved relative to this guy. And all the screenshots and HTML dumps I take, I want to put them into this directory. And uh, there's a dedicated section in the manual and different ways you can configure this. So we ran that test. Now Jeb reports directory. We don't have anything. Why don't we have anything? Ah. That'll do it. So now I've got my HTML at the end of each of those test steps. So if I go back to my. So Spock allows me to break my story up into discrete steps as well. So I've got these when and then blocks. I'm also using another Spock feature to turn my whole test class into one long story. So the stepwise feature here says that this is all really one story, so I need you to execute these sequentially. Guarantees that we're first going to run this method, then we're going to run this method. And the benefit of that is it allows me to break up the scenario that I'm testing into smaller chunks that are more meaningful but also, for the, in terms of reporting, I get reports at the end of each of these steps. If something goes wrong, in the middle of your story, you've got a much quicker um, indication of what part of the test went wrong. Whereas in this case, if I was using JUnits, if I fail anywhere in here, I just see that this actual test method failed. Because one of the benefits of using Spock and Stepwise is that I can, when something goes wrong, see that. So let's make it fail. Actually, let's make it fail up here. Yeah. Because I failed in the very first step, and I'm using step, uh, stepwise, it actually hasn't run the subsequent step. There's no point continuing, because then we've not met a precondition here. So I can much, if, it, if I had sort of 10 steps of this, I could much quicker hone into exactly what the issue was. 
notice uh, one of the other things that Spot gives you is some, some really nice diagnostic error messages. So I was expecting it to be sin page, and I actually got sign in page. It's even telling me which of the characters were wrong. If I try and do something such as pull out a H10 element, there's no such thing on the page. This is, a, this is a really bad example. I'm not going to do that one. Um, move on, I'll come back to that. So, a little bit just about before we get on to page objects dealing with this Navigator API, the content selection stuff. The general form is that there are three, a three aspects to it a CSS selector, any valid CSS selector, an index or range, because a CSS selector can match multiple things. So, I might need to say I want the third thing. That that CSS selector match, and I can also further refine based on certain attributes. So in this case, I'm going to select all divs on the page, and the navigator object is similar to a jQuery object in that it represents one or more things, so zero or more things. So it's always a collection. I say I want the first div here. If I want the first three divs, I can use a groovy range to pull that out. So it allows me to get into and sort of bust apart that collection. The attribute selectors are useful for grabbing things based on attribute, but we also have this kind of special attribute here, text, which matches the no text. So in this case, I'm going to get the third H2 with an ID of section and whose textual content is Jeb. The any attribute matches just get and together. So for CSS selectors, you can use full power CSS3 uh, if the browser supports it, and everything does since IE8. So all the modern browsers that you'll be um, automating support full CSS3 selectors. And the CSS3 is very powerful. There are many aspects to it that allow you to do very fine-grained lookups. And you should prefer to use CSS3 for your lookups wherever possible, because browsers are insanely fast at being able to resolve these things. They need to, to in order to apply CSS style sheets, they can actually take a CSS selector and use that to find content very quickly. It's much more efficient in, in, for browsers to do this in the next half. So attribute and text matching, um, we using Groovy sort of name parameter or inline map syntax here. We're matching the foo attributes with the bar. In this case, we're going to match the text. And I can even use regular expressions here to do partial matching of content for text or attributes. Jeb also supplies some handy predicates for doing partial matches. And these are just available as part of the DSL. So I wanted, in this case, I want to grab all paragraphs that start whose text starts with the letter P. I can just use any of these methods. And the manual lists all of them that are there. So quite useful when you've got markup that doesn't have CSS selectors or valuable IDs. The only way you can grab something is by the text, and you can sort of partially match on that. For relative content, once I've used the dollar method to return a navigator, there are methods that are part of its API for finding things uh, finding content relative to what was previously found. So it's quite a comprehensive API for um, grabbing content off the page. And it's intuitive in the same way that jQuery is. It's really one of the powerful things of jQuery. Right, so page objects. Uh, for those people who are doing this kind of testing already, is anybody not using page objects in their tests? Right, so let's explain what page objects are. And the question, what are page objects, effectively? No. Yeah, who's not using them? So who's doing these kind of tests, but not using page objects? OK, cool. So I don't need to go into too much detail. But so what are page objects? I mean, it's, it's not a new idea. It's been around for some time now. But what does it really mean? Well, it's really domain modeling. It's the same kind of process we use to make sense of our application code, we apply modeling techniques to it. So instead of dealing with a bunch of content selectors, whether it be XPath or CSS, we can use higher order concepts. So you, you don't want to see this kind of code, and we've, we've been looking at it so far in your tests. Hard-coded content lookups that are duplicated in a lot of places. It's brittle when things change. You have to change it in a bunch of, bunch of places. It's also not very descriptive of actually what's going on here. I can extract the meaning from this rather quickly, but if the names, the uh, content selectors were, say, compressed, 
I wouldn't know what is that actual content that it's grabbing on the page. What is attribute ID X Y Z one two three? What is that thing to me? So, domain mod uh, page object modeling is about uh, modeling the content with meaningful names as well as the operations that you perform on pages. So traditional programming techniques of encapsulation, reuse, and composition. So instead of having this kind of code in my test where I have to look at it and think, okay, this is probably performing a login wrapping it up behind a method that explicitly states what's going on. Jeb's really bakes the uh, page object pattern in quite deep, and it allows us to give significant names to content. In this case, we had a login function that was modeling some kind of action on the page, but we can also explicitly model the content. We'll see that in a second. When you kind of crank this up to 11, you start to see the same kinds of concepts that appear in your application appearing in your tests. So we have an application that has orders, we're dealing with some kind of invoicing. In our tests, instead of seeing selectors, we're starting to see these kinds of things. So I want the first order on the page, the third line item, I'm testing that as price is to. How did it work in Jeb? Well, there's a subclass, there's a superclass that you extend called jeb.page. And it provides a kind of framework for this stuff and some DSLs. Three kind of um, main aspects. I can define what is the URL of this page. If I want to go to this page, where should I go? How do I check that I'm at this page at a particular point in the test? And also, importantly, what is the content on the page? Before we dig into those in a bit of detail, a browser has a page. So this is the way kind of JD, uh, JD implements the page object pattern to say that the, the browser has this instance, and while we're executing, we're going to swap browser.page out with different instances, representing where we are in a particular application. So once I send, use the to method to say, take the browser to this login page, its page object is now an instance of the login page. As we move through the test, that's going to change. And as we saw, when I call methods on the browser object, it will automatically delegate it down to the page objects. I don't need to write browser.page.login. I can write browser.login and using Groovy Dynamism forward that around. So the URL static parameter defines that when I say go to this page, where am I actually going to go? I can use absolute URLs in here. It's more common to use a relative URL because where your application is actually deployed can change over time, but the parts within the application are usually much more static and it's resolved based on that configuration mechanism that I showed. The at checking, in here we use the same kind of code we would use in the then block of a Spock test, so this kind of thing. But we put it in a special place on the page object in order to do a quick sanity check when moving through our test to say, are we at the page we expect to be at? Or um, diagnostics, when things go wrong, and you uh, end up in surprising places in the application, checking to make sure you're at the right place before you start looking for specific things means you'll get better error messages. That's the idea behind that. And there's a, as part of the DSL, there's a special at method, or the at class of the page, and it will run that at check for me. So the content DSL, which is kind of the um, enables the conciseness of Jeb, I guess, compared to other frameworks that are sort of annotation-based or XML-based. Inside the content block of a page, the general format is uh, name. So what are we going to name this content? Any options about um, how the content is going to work? And some kind of uh, look up. What is the actual content on the page? So this is what it looks like. I'm saying the heading on this page is the H1. So after I go to that page, I can just read it out like it's a property. All of the defined content in here becomes properties of a page object. So it's not just for properties, though. I can use these kind of content templates as methods. I can parameterize them. They're Groovy closures, so I use normal Groovy closure syntax for specifying that this actually takes some parameters. And I can use that parameter in the content lookup. So now, instead of reading it as a property, I call it as a method. And I'm saying I want the effectively the fourth list item here. 
One of the features of the content DSL is that content can actually stack on top of each other. From a content definition, I can refer to other content definitions. So in this case, if we work through this, this is modeling the Google results page, I want to model the first result link, which is really the result link at index zero, which is really the result at that particular index, because the result is actually a div on the Google results page. So I'm getting that result div back. And within there, I'm finding the first link with class L, which is actually the link object. And my lookup for a result, sorry, they're not divs, they're list items. So my definition of the result lookup is to say, well, I actually want the result of this particular index, and the results are all the list items with class G. So you can have sophisticated content lookups that you can kind of model in this way, so you can use sensible names and understand what's actually going on. The content that I'm modeling doesn't have to be Jeb Navigator objects. I can also model strings, uh, any type of class, I can have any type of value in here. So in this case, everything we were returning was effectively a navigator, what was coming back from the dollar object, so the dollar method. But I can model the actual text or the price or something like that and convert it to a number. Some of the options that are available. By default, when you ask for content on a page, Jeb will validate that that selector actually found something as a kind of fail-fast mechanism. So you're expecting to find this thing, there's nothing there, so Jeb will throw an exception. But sometimes things aren't on the page, and that's OK. In certain conditions, they're not there, and that's what you want to test for. So you turn that off. You can also specify that this content may not be there yet. That when I request it, Jeb should poll for it and see if it's actually been updated yet. So if you think about any kind of AJAX operation that updates the page, this is what's going on. I can't log in and then immediately ask for the login status because I have to wait for the request to be processed, AJAX response to come back, and the page to be updated. So embedding it in this DSL here allows me to remove any kind of sleeping or any kind of looping from in my test. The definition that this is dynamic is within the DSL. So the modules, so we were talking about pages. Modules are a similar kind of concept, but they're fragments. Reusable definitions of content that I can include into pages and reuse. So in this case, in my application, I have a cart info, little thing talking about the price and um, some other things. Yeah, I think we'll just the cost of modeling here. Right, so within my particular page, I can just include this module. So now the cart info property of this home page is this guy, card info module. So I can do, go to the home page, assert that the card info total cost is 10. Because I'm modeling that content here, using the module keyword in the DSL to specify this is the module content. Also really good for modeling repeating content. So in this case, I have a simple table two columns, title and author, and some books in here. I can model each row in the table as a module. So I've got a book row here, um, identifying the particular columns. And within my page, I can use another keyword saying module list. So this is going to grab all of the rows in the table, and Jeb will, for each of those rows, create a module of this type, which allows me then to write code like this. Expect that the the title of the first book is this. The, the second book's author is this. So this is how we can sort of start, start to set, um, one of the techniques for doing an actual real domain modeling. OK, so a few, before I jump into the source labs, a short time I have left, uh, just a few features you may not know about. You can also, um, so before we do that, so what does the actual spec look like in the end? So, so far we've been looking at scripts and specs that weren't really doing page object modeling. But after going through that, going through the same process, if we model our content, this is what we end up with. So this is a fully executable test. So that's um, pretty clear. It's pretty clear what's going on here. Things have got good names. Um, if you're using Jeb, one thing you may not know is that you can also 
Okay, so one of, one of the aspects of Jeb being such a dynamic DSL is that I've got a lot of underlines in this script. These are all dispatched at runtime, and the IDE doesn't know what these things are. It's a dynamic DSL. But if you're really into autocomplete, you can keep track of the page object. So the to and at methods return the page instance. And in IDEA, Eclipse doesn't have this feature, unfortunately, but IDEA has special support for Jeb. It understands the content DSL. So it knows that, well, this heading is actually this. So you have to do a little bit more work if you want the, the content completion. This normal DSL won't give it to you, but um, it is there. You just have to keep track of this page object. So here at this point, I'm expected to be at the login page still. And get full click through. So ad hoc waiting, we saw that in the content DSL I can specify that I should wait before selecting content. But I also can use this wait for method anywhere in the DSL to specify that I, I need you to poll and to keep trying until you find this content. And because of the, the flexibility of Groovy's notion of truth, this actually becomes a very powerful construct. So in this case, I'm waiting for any paragraph with class error message to appear on the page then I'm asserting with text value. In this case, I'm waiting for any paragraph with class error message with some text to show up. Because if it doesn't have any text, this is going to be an empty string, and Groovy treats that as false. So we need to return some kind of truthy value from this closure. In this case, I'm actually going to wait for the paragraph with class error message to have a specific value. Because sometimes the content is there, and you're waiting for the value to change. If this condition fails after some amount of time, you'll get an exception, saying that waiting for this to happen didn't happen, and you'll get a nice diagnostic message like we saw in running the tests. The timeout, uh, the timeout and retry rate is configurable. You have full access over that. You can also um, download bytes directly within your Jeb test. So the scenario here is that you're testing an application that you need to log into, and it serves PDF files, and I want to. Log in when I test that I can log into the application and the PDF is correct. A web driver doesn't know anything about testing PDFs. So what I want to do is get those bytes into my JVM and test them with a PDF kit or some kind of library like that. But I can't just make a direct URL call to that URL to get the PDF because it requires cookies and session state in order to authorize it. So what the direct downloading feature does is actually copy all the cookies from the browser into the VM make a request with those cookies to save the session state. Get around this problem. And you can access it as an input stream, get the text if you don't want the bytes. There's also a JavaScript interface for calling JavaScript functions on the page directly if you need to interact with it that way. It's kind of a, a bridge here that there's this JavaScript object that I can read variables on and that will actually look for a JavaScript variable in the browser and return that value. So sometimes this is necessary because you need to tweak the page to make it testable or something like that. So I have a global variable here which I'm reading, and a global function, and I can actually call the JavaScript function just like a Groovy function. And Jeb will forward all that information and return the return value. There's also a special jQuery adapter. If you're using jQuery in your application, for any object you can do, for any Jeb navigator object, do jot jQuery and get a kind of proxy for the jQuery object in the browser. So key down is a jQuery method, and that's going to actually call key down on the jQuery object of this guy in the browser. So sometimes it can be useful for simulating user events and that kind of thing. Jeb actually also has its own way of um, simulating user events, and it's not actually simulating them, it's doing rich interactions via the operating system. So in this case, I want to hold down, the, uh, hold down the shift key, click and hold some piece of content, move it onto something else, release the shift key, and run the, then release just to run the action. Oh, sorry, I'm releasing the mouse. So I'm releasing the click. So I've got a little fun demo of that. I have some draggable squares my page via some jQuery plugins. 
and what I want to do for no real good reason is test that I can pick this guy up and spin it around this other guy. So here I have, I have modeled these squares as modules. So this is my square, it has a drag method, so I can drag it to a specific offset on the page. Inside here we're using the interact method of the browser object, and we can use the WebDriver DSL here. So just doing some math to work out exactly how we need to move it, and then I want to pick this guy up and drag it around. So what I end up with at the top is reasonably um, well-reading code that I want to pick up the green square, drag it to the top left corner of the blue square, then I'm going to drag it down around Tetris. So let's run this, it's kind of fun. And away we go. So, well, this is a bit of a gimmick, obviously, but a lot of user interfaces in web applications these days are supporting rich interactions. I can click and drag things, I can use the keyboard to do certain things, and you can test and emulate all that stuff with Jeb and WebDriver as well. So I have exactly three minutes. Okay, um, very quick demo on Source Labs. So the Jeb project itself, we use Source Labs to test the cross-browser features of Jeb. So we have to make sure that Jeb works in Internet Explorer and those kind of things. So I'm going to uh, do, I can't remember what the task is called. So the Jeb build is using um, a feature of Source Labs called the Open Source Tunnel. So the Source Tunnel. And to test Jeb, we start up a HTTP server locally on this machine to serve some content, and we want to uh, use that to test Jeb features. So there's a problem here in that Source Labs hosts browsers for me out on the internet in the cloud, in this cloud. So I don't have to, I don't have Internet Explorer 6 and 7 on my machine. I want to test my application with that. They provide a service that I can connect to and use their browsers. So the Source Tunnel, what's it called? Let's do Internet Explorer. So we're going to run some tests on Internet Explorer on Vista. And there's some stuff in the Jeb build here that I don't have time to go into, but we're opening an SSH tunnel up to Source Labs to create a direct connection. So they can actually, the browsers on their machine can connect back to the HTTP server here. So that's just opening up in the background. I'm initiating this SSH connection. So the source tunnel is open. So now I've got the direct secure connection between myself and Source Labs, and I can see in the Source Labs UI here, if I started up a bunch of browsers, I can actually watch those browsers run. So Internet Explorer is living on their servers, it's talking back to my machine by the secure connection and running through the tests. So, um, I'm out of time, unfortunately, but uh, if you're interested in this, um, the, the Jeb build itself has examples of the code to do all this kind of stuff. Um, I can run it in the IDE, I can run it in Jenkins, all that kind of thing. So, so very, Source Labs is a very compelling service if you want to do cross-browser testing. Um, there's some information in the Jeb manual as well, and the setup for this stuff.
Yep. yep. So, so if, if you go, go to Source Labs, it's a commercial service, and they provide um, browsers that you can connect to with Jeb. If you pay them the money, they'll happily yeah, give you the service. Yeah, absolutely. So they're a cloud provider of this stuff. Yeah. So and rather than running up your own fleet of Internet Explorer instances that you can use to test with, you can use. So, yeah. Yep, so depending on how much money you give them is how many jobs you can run in parallel. So in this case, I'm, they were um, nice enough to give me a free account because I'm for an open source project, and I'm running three connections simultaneously. So I'm having three browsers to test my application at once. Different parts of it. I'm using, the, I'm using Gradle to do the parallelism of that. I'm not sure I don't have quite, that's very easy to set up. If you want to run tests in parallel with Gradle, it's quite an easy configuration option. So. So, yeah, so I'm, I didn't mean to go into that in more detail, but I'm out of time and I can tell people I've got flights and things to catch. So uh, thank you very much. If you do have questions, I'm around. Thank you.